Lissa Productions. Okay, welcome back to Experimental Physics. Today we begin a series of experiments on the speed of sound in gases. Just a recap of the theory, we assume that we can treat the gas as an ideal gas, that is to say the pressure times the volume is the number of moles times the universal gas constant times the temperature. We further assume that the sound waves propagate through the gas so quickly that there is no time for heat to be transferred from the locally compressed regions to the adjacent locally expanded regions. And the equation for an adiabatic process is PV to the gamma power is a constant. This gamma factor contains all the information about the structure of the molecule. So that's very relevant to exploring how the structure affects the speed of sound. So from these two assumptions, we get a prediction for the speed of sound. Namely, the speed is the square root of gamma RT over M where M is the molar mass of the gas. So what we'll do is to compare this theoretical prediction to a measurement of the speed of sound, which we derive by assuming that we get a series of resonances in a closed uniform pipe, which form a harmonic series. So the frequency of the nth resonance is simply an integer multiple N times the fundamental frequency, which is the speed over twice the length of the pipe. So if we measure as many of these resonances, harmonics, as you possibly can find, and plot the frequency of the resonance as a function of the harmonic number, the slope of that plot is related to the speed of sound. So we compare the experimentally determined speed to the theoretically predicted speed. The apparatus consists of a closed uniform pipe. This one happens to be made of copper. There is a speaker connected to one end of the pipe and then sealed up. The speaker is driven by the digital function generator that you've already used a couple of times in previous experiment. So we drive the speaker with a fixed frequency and at the other end of the pipe there is a microphone connected to an oscilloscope. So the oscilloscope allows you to visualize the standing wave pattern inside the pipe. The temperature is measured using a digital thermometer. This is required to do the theoretical prediction. The predicted speed depends on properties of the gas and on the temperature. The a pair of uh, thermocouple probes gives you the temperature at one end of the pipe and at the center of the pipe and maybe you can average those to get an estimate of what the temperature of the system is. So we'll just turn on the function generator and create some sound and then turn on the oscilloscope to detect the waves. Now one of the most common pitfalls in doing this experiment is uh, forgetting to turn on the microphone. So most of the microphones in the collection are battery powered and many of them have an inline switch. If you forget to turn on that switch, you won't get anything at all on the oscilloscope. So do remember to check to be sure that the switch is turned on if you have the type of microphone that has a switch. So now what we observe is a rather smallish looking wave on the oscilloscope screen. And what we'd like to do is to find a resonance. So we want to change the frequency. This function generator happened to have come on at a frequency of 1000 hertz, which is comfortably within the audio range. But this may or may not be an actual resonance or standing wave. So we change the frequency by doing one of two things. You can either punch in the frequency that you want and then press the Hertz button at the bottom of this far right column, or you can gradually increment the frequency by pressing either the up arrow or the down arrow, and that will increment the flashing digit on the display. So let's just uh, move down in frequency. I'll just kind of lean on the down button and gradually change the frequency 
and we'll watch what happens on the oscilloscope. And now something interesting is beginning to happen. When we come near to a resonance frequency, the amplitude of the response on the microphone begins to increase. So I'll just continue to reduce the frequency. Watching the oscilloscope screen and what I'm trying to find is the frequency that produces the maximum amplitude of the wave on the screen. And I've passed it, it's getting smaller, so let me back up. And that's going past, so we'll go the other way. And right about there is probably a resonance. And what I've done here is to tune the frequency at the level of one hertz at a time. If you want to be even more precise, you can change the frequency at the level of a tenth of a hertz. I don't think it's worth your time trying to tune even more precisely than that. So about plus or minus one hertz is good enough for many of the resonances, maybe down to the level of a tenth of a hertz. I want to explain a couple of the really serious pitfalls that many people run into. Suppose you forget to turn on the microphone, so to switch the microphone off. And what we see on the oscilloscope screen is just a flat line. So what you should never do is to blindly turn on the equipment, forgetting to turn on the microphone, and then hit this feature called the auto set button. The auto set function can be your best friend if things are set up properly, or it can be your worst enemy if things are not set up properly. So let me just uh, show you what happens if you hit the auto set button. Uh, first of all, the oscilloscope was set up appropriately for frequencies in the audio range. The time base was set at one millisecond per division on the screen, which means about one kilohertz frequency. But if we press the auto set button with no signal, what will happen is that the oscilloscope will lock on to the strongest signal it can find. And in this case, it locks on to something in the 100 megahertz range, which is way into the radio frequency. It's basically picking up something like WRCT, the campus radio station, or something like that. So this will be absolutely useless for trying to measure any resonances in the sound pipe. So be sure. Before you turn anything on, don't hit the auto set button until you've checked to be sure that the microphone is actually turned on. And now I'll hit this again. And it locks on to the much stronger audio signal, which is what you really want to measure. So this is in, in the kilohertz range. Now one other feature that we have done for you to save you a bit of pain and heartache there is a ground wire connected from the metal sound tube to the ground connection on the oscilloscope. If I disconnect that, watch what happens to the wave on the oscilloscope. It suddenly starts to go crazy. So the pipe is behaving like a big antenna and it's picking up electromagnetic noise probably in the 60 hertz range from the overhead fluorescent lights. So this little grounding feature gets rid of all that unwanted noise and allows you to measure only the audio signal. So just remember, don't press the auto set button until you're sure that you have the microphone turned on and then it should lock on to an audio frequency provided also that you are driving the speaker with the function generator. So that should enable you to do the experiment much more easily without pain and heartache. So the basic functions of the oscilloscope that you'll want to know about include the gain, that is the sensitivity of the instrument. If you turn this knob, that will change the size of the wave. What you'd like to do is to adjust this knob until the entire wave fits comfortably within the size of the screen. So you don't want to 
have the resonance going off the scale. Uh, just make sure that it all stays on the screen by adjusting the sensitivity. So something like this where the resonance is filling about half of the screen is a good sensitivity. The other important control is the speed at which the oscilloscope uh, sweeps across the screen. So this controls the time and turning it one way compresses the wave, makes this a, a longer amount of time across the width of the screen. Turning it the other way makes a shorter amount of time so there are fewer oscillations of the wave. The time per division, so there are little blocks on the screen about one centimeter high and one centimeter wide. The time per division is displayed right below the center of the screen right here and it's currently 200 microseconds per division. If I change it one notch the other way it goes to 400 microseconds per division and uh, now it's one uh, millisecond per division. The sensitivity is displayed just below the lower left hand corner uh, of the screen and right now it's at 100 millivolts per centimeter. If I increase the sensitivity now 50 millivolts per centimeter and so forth. So once again keep the sensitivity such that the amplitude of the wave fits comfortably within the size of the screen and the time so that you can see several oscillations and that uh, will give a nice clear indication of where the resonances are. So we've measured one resonance at a frequency of about 901 hertz but the question is which resonance is that? We really don't know at this point. What I might suggest is that you begin your series of measurements by making a prediction. So if we assume that all of the harmonics are in fact integer multiples of a fundamental, what you could do is to assume the speed of sound in air at room temperature. So just calculate the predicted speed and divide it by twice the measured length of the pipe. So you can use a meter stick to get an estimate from the end of the speaker to the microphone just approximately to get a rough idea. This is about uh, 78 centimeters. So put in 0.78 meters with the predicted speed of sound and just for fun I'm going to put in the number two and predict what the second harmonic is. It turns out that if you do the calculation for air at room temperature using a length of about 0.78 meters, you get a resonance frequency that is suspiciously close to concert A, which is 440 hertz. So uh, remember this number, 901, and we'll just punch in uh, 440. And remember to hit the frequency button, 440 hertz. And we see something that looks like a pretty nice response, but let's tune a little bit and see if that really is one of the resonances. I'm going to go up in frequency just a little bit and watch what happens to the oscilloscope. So going up in frequency, the amplitude is increasing. That's a good sign. And now it's starting to go back down again, so we'll back up. Oops, that went down. So right about there. So we found a resonance frequency of about 446 hertz. Just for fun, let's multiply that by two. So if this really is the second harmonic, twice that should be the fourth harmonic. So 2 times 446 is 902, which is suspiciously close to the frequency that we measured previously for one of the resonances. So we'll just punch in 902, and remember to press the hertz button. So that's pretty close. Let's tune a little bit. Going up in frequency reduces the amplitude, so that's the wrong direction. And right about there, yeah, so, well, that illustrates experimental uncertainty. We get 902, previous time we got 901. 
So that would be the procedure that you make an initial prediction for one of the harmonics and explore in the neighborhood of the frequency that you predicted until you find exactly what frequency actually resonates and then proceed to maybe double it or cut it in half or find as many frequencies as you can find that produce the resonances. So just to recap, what we do is to predict the speed of sound by measuring the temperature and then measure the speed of sound by gathering as much data as we can on the various resonances in the pipe. So find as many of these harmonics as you can, plot the frequency of the resonance as a function of the harmonic number, and the slope is related to the experimental speed of sound.